good morning, and thank you all for coming here today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, it's Tony Collins. I'm the president of this great institution, Clarkson University. Uh, so I'd like to welcome the governor on a return to Potsdam, and thank you for being on our campus. Uh, we are tremendously excited and proud to have you. I'd like to just uh, identify a couple of our trustees, uh, Mark Wozniak and uh, Jim Rance. Is Jim here? Jim, thank you. And I also have some other distinguished guests, um, Chairman John Putney, St. Lawrence County Board of Legislators. Well, maybe we should hear it for our trustees as well. They pay my salary. Uh, Sheriff Kevin Wells, St. Lawrence County. Kevin. Mayor Steve Gardas, Village of Potsdam. Steve. Supervisor Marie Reagan, Town of Potsdam. And Gary Douglas, who is uh, President and CEO of North Country Chamber of Commerce. He's also the co-chair with me on the Regional Economic Development Council. Gary. So over the last two years, I have literally had the pleasure of serving as the North Country Regional Economic Development Co-Chair with Gary Douglas. In that capacity, I have gotten to work with the Governor and his staff uh, in building a comprehensive and transformative uh, economic development plan for the North Country. Uh, and I, I say very proudly on behalf of all those who have worked so hard with that Economic Development Council that we've seen great success, uh, being funded as, as winners in the program for the last two years. That's literally brought almost $200 million of economic development projects into the North Country. In some of the other regions, they focused on large, singular projects. Here, we've tried to disperse the wealth and we've created what we call firecrackers uh, across of economic development across the North Country. And we believe that that it works well for our geography and, and our kind of uh, our, the economy in, in the North Country. And so you'll see, probably most of you in this room could reach out and touch one of the now uh, over 100 projects that have been funded. So we're very excited about that. Through the Regional Economic Development Council, uh, the governor has really made a statement and listened to us and said that one size doesn't fit all. That we get to choose our future, develop our own economic development plan. Governor, in my memory at least, you're the first governor to really understand the needs of the North Country to allow us to take a hold of our own future. We can't thank you enough for that opportunity. What I'd like uh, to do next is, uh, when we were down in Albany about, uh, I think it was in August, September of last year, all the co-chairs met and uh, we went around the table to give some updates. And clearly, I heard you give two challenges. The first was that we wanted to stop the brain drain. We wanted to identify our graduates with their talents and aspirations and to keep them in our locales, in the North Country in our case. The second challenge, and it kind of left the room with a, with a pause, there was a pregnant moment, and you challenged us to bring, when, when was the first region going to bring someone from Silicon Valley and transplant them into New York? Governor, I'm really pleased to say we believe that we're meeting both of your challenges. Right here with us is Matt Turcock. He's a junior at Clarkson in our Young Entrepreneurs Program. That means that during his time here, we're supporting him. We meet his tuition requirements. We're exchanging that for equity in his company. And Matt will uh, give you a little more background on that. But three weeks ago, he closed on the purchase, uh, purchase of an office building in Watertown with 65 storage units. So he's expanding his concepts. That will be the headquarters for what will become a global operation. And then the second part of the challenge, Peter Wu. Peter, I'd like you to stand, please. So Peter comes to us from Silicon Valley. Please stay standing, Peter. <laughs> now, what's, in 
interesting about Peter is, of course, that he's had two startup experiences in Silicon Valley. He's attracted, frankly, because of uh, Mark Wozniak, who was the present CEO of Slick, is now transferring out of that business. But together they came, they saw the opportunity here. And I'm sure Peter can exchange with you why he believes this can be a tremendously successful location for his company. But it also connects into our strategic plan. And that is that agriculture and homegrown products are something that we believe we can build a future on in the North Country. Peter's company, Polchair, is a new way of marketing those products via the web, a different way of delivering those products into homes, not just in the North Country, but around the world, around the nation, around the world. So thank you, Peter, for bringing your Silicon Valley expertise right here to Potsdam, New York. Thank you. Those two are the tip of the iceberg. In the last two years, right now, we have incorporated 45 companies from Clarkson staff, faculty, and most importantly, students. We have 125 in the pipeline. We look forward to your innovation hotspot opportunities. It is the tip of the iceberg, the two people I've just talked about. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Matt Turcott uh, to come up and introduce you. Matt, please be brief, because you are cutting class to be here. Thank you very much, Tony. I appreciate it. And I'd like to welcome Governor Cuomo to Clarkson University. Thank you for being here today. My name is Matthew Turcotte, and I'm a junior here at Clarkson, majoring in innovation and entrepreneurship. I am originally from the Thousand Islands region in a small town called Clayton. I also happen to be the founder of North Shore Solutions, a website development and internet consulting company that I founded when I was 16 years old in my parents' basement. The company grew from being a small little startup with a couple of clients to being a six-figure-a-year company catering to hundreds of clients across the country. North Shore Solutions offers many services, including website logo design, online hosting services, maintenance services, and focuses on catering to the website needs of small municipal governments and small businesses. I had always been passionate about entrepreneurship. And when I came to visit Clarkson as a junior in high school, I had the privilege of meeting President Collins as a prospective student. The result was the Young Entrepreneurs Program, an innovative approach to supporting my business and paying for my education here at Clarkson. Through Clarkson's Race Center for Entrepreneurship, I have been able to expand my business while still learning new and innovative ways to become an entrepreneur and grow my company. After just two and a half years here and some great mentoring from the faculty, I have expanded my business ventures. I recently started a new company called Grindstone Holdings, a real estate holdings company, which has purchased a commercial building in Watertown with four tenants and 65 storage units. Clarkson has provided me an incubator, a professional office space, and resources so that I could run a business and handle a full course load at the same time. This is a new way of creating and supporting businesses in the North Country, where if a student has an idea, they can work with the university and make that idea a reality by the time that they graduate. That way, instead of having to look for a job, they can continue to expand their business and they can transition into that business full time. This is exactly what Governor Cuomo's technology transfer proposal will achieve the commercialization of good ideas and the creation of new businesses to take them to market by connecting academics, venture capitalists, business leaders, and other professionals and entrepreneurs to facilitate and grow the commercialization process and keep it in New York. And his hotspots will provide startups for students like me across the state with incubators that support growth through tax-free zones. The governor wants students to create New York, expand their businesses in New York, and ultimately to thrive in New York. I was born in the North Country, I went to, the sc to school in the North Country, and I want to stay in the North Country. Because I know that business can grow and thrive. Governor Cuomo's plan to invest in small businesses like mine and students like me is an investment in New York's future. 
He knows that too many students like me develop new technology and then leave the state to bring it to another market, and that ultimately hurts all of us. New York loses when students, entrepreneurs, and businesses leave the state to make our fortunes. I plan on staying in New York because I know our governor believes in small businesses like mine and is willing to invest in my future and the future of New York. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to the governor of the great state of New York, Andrew Vaughn. myself because I've been hearing for so long uh, about all the great things that are going on at Clarkson. To Tony Collins, who, as you know, is an extraordinary talent, and uh, we have been deploying his energy and resources all across the state, I want you to know, because he is a dynamic force and he's been of great help to me in my administration, and, and people all across the state. Uh, have really benefited from his leadership and his guidance. And let's give him a round of applause. Tony. Thank you. And to the other chair of the Regional Economic Development Council, Gary Douglas, who's with us. Gary, why don't you stand and let's give Gary a round of applause. talk about the North Country Regional Economic Development Council, which is, which is really going extraordinarily well, uh, as you heard uh, Tony explain. And it was a very simple concept, but it was a, it, you'll, you'll find as you move on in life, uh, most of the intelligent concepts are relatively simple. It's uh, execution and implementation that becomes the trick. There are not a lot of overly complex ideas. And the Regional Economic Development Council was, why don't we get an entire region of the state to work together? And why don't we get people to cooperate rather than compete? And why don't we get people in neighboring jurisdictions to come together, get around the table, business leaders, academic leaders, entrepreneurs, government officials, and say, look, let's come up with one plan, one vision for this region, and let's all focus in the same direction. Very simple. Now, regions, we don't think in terms of regions. We're actually organized in terms of counties and towns and villages, but that's not the way the economy works. The economy works in regions, so you have to get people to think outside the box. You have to get people to literally step over the line. You have to look at a map and see all the lines. I'm in this town, I'm in this county, I'm in this village. No, you're in one region. And it's called the North Country Region. Now, the North Country region had an added burden that it's one of the largest regions in the state. And historically, it didn't associate itself as one place. There was an eastern side, there was a western side, there was a northern side. So it was, it was a simple concept. It was a difficult undertaking done extraordinarily well. For me, I've always had truly a love for the North Country. Uh, it sounds like a cliche, a love for a North Country. It's, it's genuine. I first came up when I was in my uh, late teens. And there is a gift that God gave us in the North Country that uh, is unlike any place else on the planet, I believe. Uh, it is beautiful. It is natural. Uh, the people are special. And I come up here whenever I can. 
when I have a especially long couple of days in Albany, and you can have long days in Albany, trust me. Uh, I'll sneak up just to, uh, just to get a sense of peace. Uh, and peace uh, is, is uh, more important as we get older. So uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Now, I want to talk to you today about something called the uh, State of the State. Uh, the beginning, beginning of the year in January, our elected officials, presidents, governors, mayors, will do a State of the State address, Governor of the State of the State, President does the State of the Union address. The State of the State is, this is a conceptual vision for the state this year. Literally the words, these are the issues we have, these are the problems we have, this is the, the place that we are at. And here's a conceptual long-term vision to go forward. It's then followed up a couple of weeks later with the budget. And the budget is what? The budget literally is, is the dollars, the execution plan. So state of the state is a vision. Budget is then the details and the priorities and the how-to. You put those two together and you basically get a road map of what the governor, the executive, is proposing for that year. That plan then goes to the legislature. And the legislature then decides whether they want to pass the plan, they don't want to pass the plan, part pass, uh, pass part, uh, disregard the other. And you see that no, now going on in Washington, uh, frankly, with uh, less expediency uh, than many of us would like. Uh, the legislative process can get uh, cumbersome and can be a source of uh, argumentation, which is not necessarily bad, but it's supposed to function at the end of the day. Uh, and we have, we've seen sometimes too little function coming out of Washington. And we're going through, through the same process with the state legislature in Albany now. So I laid out the plan, and we're talking to the legislature about it. The device that I brought to Albany two years ago is a very simple one, but also a very profound one, back on the theory that the idea is simple, just the execution. Rather than just dealing with the legislators in Albany, I choose to deal with the people of the state. Why? Why? Because at the end of the day, it's very simple for me. I work for you. That's how this relationship works. I said two years ago I want to run for governor of the state. I think I have an idea that can help make the state a better state. And I asked the people of this state to vote for me, to trust me, to give me a chance. And that's the relationship that is important to me. It's my relationship with the people. And I believe ultimately the legislators will follow the people. When you take a political science course, they'll say, well, legislators, elected officials, governors, they lead and the people follow. I know that's how they, what they teach in the course. And I understand sometimes it's true. The inverse is even more correct. When the people say, this is what we want done, the politicians tend to follow the people. So I am secure in this relationship. And I'll spend the next few weeks talking to people all across the state, saying, here's my idea, here's my plan. What do you think? And if you support it, please tell your legislator you support it. And that's how we're actually going to make the government work. Because if the government doesn't work for you, then the government doesn't work. Past few months have been a tumultuous few months in the state. They've been a tumultuous few months in this country. A lot of news, good news, bad news, a lot of tragic news that we are all still processing on. So at the beginning, let's just take a moment to sort of get our bearings as to where we are. I became governor two years ago and I said in my first state of the state, I said that this state is at a crossroads and that we needed to chart a dramatically different course and begin a different trajectory if this state was going to have a future. That we were losing too many businesses, we were losing too many young people for too long. And New York was becoming more a place of the past than a place of the future. And it's time that we organize ourselves and we start a New York comeback in the core principles. One, it's about good jobs and economic growth. Second, a world-class education system. Third, fiscal integrity. 
and discipline. You can't keep taxing businesses and people and expect them to stay in the state. And four, New York has always had a special role, an additional role, as the progressive capital of the nation. Past two years, we've made a lot of progress, and we are on our way. Governor Al Smith, great former governor of the state of New York, ran for president, used to like to say, let's look at the record. If you look at the record over the past two years, the obstructionist culture of the state, the bureaucratic culture of the state is gone. We now talk about entrepreneurial government. It doesn't have to be an oxymoron. Government can be entrepreneurial. Gone is the tax capital mentality. We passed a property tax cap, tier six, which reduce, reduces the cost of pensions, and the lowest middle class tax rates in 58 years, believe it or not. That's me in the middle, by the way. Gone is the anti-business mentality replaced with regional collaboratives and a new public-private sector partnership. That's the regional economic development councils we've been talking about. And gone is the political gridlock. We've been making the government work once again, and it's a government that actually works for the people. So maybe we can just retire and say, well, everything is done. Unfortunately, we have more to do. The national economy is better than it was, but it's not great. Our mantle is the, of the progressive capital is a continuing responsibility. Justice is a journey. Justice is not ever really done. How do you become a more just society? And that you have to deal with every day. Upstate New York needs investment. It's had a struggling economy for too long. Our children are not being educated to the fullest. Mother Nature has not been kind to us. And that is an understatement. So, where do we go from here? New York's one-two punch is jobs and education. And jobs are the engine of economic development, and economic development and jobs are what drive the state. We started a new campaign, new attitude, called the New York Open for Business Efforts. We have to continue that. On a macro level, it's about bringing fiscal integrity. After years of chaos, we passed responsible budgets past two years and we passed them on time and this year once again I'm saying to the legislators let's pass a budget let's pass a balanced budget and let's pass it on time to show that the state is working and the state is working well <laughs> part of that is we made a pledge to New York, we said no new taxes, and that was a very different message for this state to send to the business community. And it's worked well, and we have to do it again this year. We've been closing budget gaps that we had for the state. This year, the budget gap is $1.3 billion, uh, which is a lot of money, and it's not easy. But if we didn't do what we had actually done two years ago, the budget gap would have been $17 billion, believe it or not. When you look at the budget gaps over the past three years, when I came in, the budget gap was $10 billion, which was 12% of the budget. Some people asked me why I wanted the job working into that deficit. Last year, we got it down to $3.5 billion. This year, we got it down to $1.3 billion. So you see, relative to where we are, um, it's, it's in much, much better shape. Um, my father, former governor of the state of New York, 1982 to 1994, his name was Mario Cuomo. I was with him yesterday and I was talking about the budget and I said, we have a $1.3 billion gap. He said, oh boy, that's terrible. I said, no, I think compared to where I was last year and the year before, on the theory of relativity. We're making, we're making very good progress. So the numbers, although seemingly very large, compared to where we were, we've made a lot of progress. How do you close a $1.3 billion deficit? You basically spend less money, and we're going to do that on the state side. We're basically going to get the majority of the savings by cutting state spending, rather than reducing funding uh, that the state might make to local governments or to not-for-profits. But the basic formula of a new New York is about jobs, and jobs come from no new taxes and fiscal integrity and on-time budget. That's the formula that's working. 
We've also had good success working on the regional economic development councils that we spoke about. You see the regions all across the state. Obviously, we're in the North Country region, but each one of those regions is a different economy. You know, people say the economy of the state of New York. There's no economy of the state of New York. There's an economy of Long Island. There's an economy of the North Country. There's an economy of Western New York. And if you want to grow the economy, you have to grow each of those regional economies because they are all different. Each regional uh, economic development council has uh, co-chairs, which we just discussed. Here we have our dynamic North Country Regional Economic Development President, looking especially dynamic and creative in this photo. <laughs> oh, plus he has that very interesting accent. You know, you would never really know Tony Collins is a boy from the Bronx. You know when you're in? <laughs> One of the greatest economic challenges that we have in this state, as we've discussed, is tech transfer. Getting the great ideas from the academic universities and having them create businesses here in the state. And it's one of the places where the state really misses the mark and gets beaten by the other states. New York University is ranked second in research dollars. We are getting the research dollars, we're coming up with the idea, ideas, but they're not being commercialized here. The venture capital phase is happening in California, Massachusetts, Texas, et cetera. So we're, we're generating the idea, but they're not starting businesses here in the state of New York. And this is an area that we have to attack. One of the ways we want to do it is what we call Innovation Hotspots Program, where within the regional economic development councils, we want to have innovation hotspots, which are 10 literally geographic areas that are partnerships between higher education and private sector incubators, and they'll be tax-free zones. So we'll take these young ideas coming out of college, we'll take Matthew, we'll say, we want you to stay here, we want you to grow in New York, we'll put you in a business incubator, which is a picture of building, and we'll provide you with support services, we'll have lawyers, we'll have accountants to help you grow that business, We'll invest in your business as a state, the way Clarkson did. We'll invest in your business, but you have to commit to stay here in the state of New York. And in the meantime, you'll pay no taxes during that initial phase where your business is starting to develop. Let's invest in Matthew. Let's invest in those young entrepreneurs. Let's keep them here. Let's grow this state economy. That's what Innovation is all about. We also have to say to the existing businesses, we're going to reduce the cost of doing business because we understand how expensive doing business is in New York. We have to reform the workers' compensation program, which uh, costs billions, businesses billions of dollars. And we have to reform the unemployment insurance program. We propose doing both in this year's budget, which will be $1.3 billion in savings to businesses. We have to train our workforce, and our workforce training now is from a different era. We just, we do it at a, for a different industry. We're going to work with SUNY and the community, CUNY Community College system, because generic job training programs just don't work anymore. We have these generic programs that give you a basic skill set, and then they say, now go try to find a job. That's not the way it works. We want to do it the other way around, and have a job linkage program where we first identify the job and then train to that job. We have an opportunity because jobs are coming back from overseas. A few years ago, all the corporations said, well, we're going to move overseas because labor is cheaper. You know what they found when they got overseas with their cheap labor? They had cheap labor, but the cheap labor didn't have the skills. So now they're turning around, they're getting back on the boat, and they're coming back because they need the skills that we have here. And that's an opportunity for us. But we have to train our workers for the skill set for those very specific positions and make those linkages. And our community college system has to retool to do just that. And that's what we want to do this year in our job linkage program. 210,000 unfilled jobs in the state of New York. Because we don't have people who can fill those jobs today because they don't have the skill set. The community college should be training for each one of those 210,000 jobs, 
and that's what the Next Generation New York Job Program is all about. Identify the employer, identify the job, identify the skill set, community college trained specifically for that job. Next issue, Teddy Roosevelt said no man can be a good citizen. Today he would have said no man or woman can be a good citizen unless he has a wage more than sufficient to cover the bare cost of living. We have something called the minimum wage law in the state of New York that sets the minimum wage. Right now the minimum wage, if you work 40 hours per week, is 14,000 per week. I'm sorry, per year. Annual cost of gasoline is $1,200 per year. Annual cost of electricity is $1,300 per year. Auto insurance, $1,400. Unless you have my record, and then you pay much, much more than the $1,400. Groceries, $6,000. Child care, $10,000. Cost, annual cost of housing, $15,000. The annual minimum wage is $14,000. My friends, those numbers just don't add up. The minimum wage does not pay enough to live in the state of New York. We're out of pace with other states and other neighboring states. We propose raising the minimum wage to $8.75 an hour. It's the right thing to do. It's the fair thing to do. And it's long overdue. Legislator, legislature, we should pass that reform this year. We also want to do an additional focus on upstate New York because upstate New York has been, has been dealing with decades of decline. Just look at these numbers. Over the past 10 years, New York City has grown 16 percent, the country has grown 9 percent, New York State has grown 11 percent, the upstate economy has only grown 5 percent. That's over the past 10 years. Now, we have a number of programs to revitalize upstate New York. It's been one of my top focuses over the past two years. We've done regional economic development councils, energy highway, capping the property tax cap. In this budget, we have initiatives for upstate New York, but we want to do even more. Currently, there is no real marketing plan for upstate New York. And we want to start through the I Love New York Market New York campaign, a multifaceted marketing campaign to bolster upstate New York. First, we make, we have all sorts of progress, uh, products and assets in upstate New York that no one knows about, that we just don't market. We have a story that we just don't tell. We want to do a coordinated marketing plan around New York products, our wine, our beer, our yogurt. We're going to start the Taste New York program that will market our New York made progress pro products. We're going to have duty free shops all across the state as a way to induce people to buy New York products and become associated for the first time. Second, we want to market regional attractions. Currently, the state tourism effort focuses on county by county tourism efforts. We want to have, again, regions working with each other to create a synergy. And we're going to have a $5 million advertising competition for the region that comes up with the best marketing plan for that region. Let them tell their story, and we'll sell it. And there are all sorts of attractions all across upstate New York. Western New York, you have Niagara Falls, you have the Finger Lakes, the Thousand Islands, Hudson Valley. North Third will have marketing campaigns around specific events. Why? Because our challenge is to reintroduce people to upstate New York. I believe if you get them to upstate New York and they see what we have and they meet the people and they meet the assets, they will come back, they will invest, uh, they'll move in. But we have to make that introduction in the first place. And that will be about advertising special events and creating special events. Create events to get people to come up and see upstate New York. For example, New York has some of the best white water rafting in the nation. This year, we're going to sponsor a national whitewater rafting competition called the Adirondack Challenge, and we're going to invite teams from all across the country, all across the world, to come join our whitewater rafting competition. Just to spice it up a bit, part of the competition can be between elected officials 
And I'm going to propose a politician division to be part of this competition. And here will be the rules for the politician division. You must have at least six people in the raft. Teams must be co-ed. Rafters must be bona fide government employees for six months, no ringers. All rafters must paddle, no freeloading politicians. All identical rafts and identical equipment, unless, of course, for security reasons, you need something else. The first class will be the executive to the assembly challenge. That is assembly speaker Sheldon Silver, who was also happens to be a great outdoorsman. Many of you may not know. I think he's from New York City. We'll have an executive to the Senate challenge. That's Senator Dean Skelos and Senator Jeff Klein. They are both, uh, they paddle sometimes in different directions, but <laughs> they're doing the best they can. We're going to invite our friend from New York City, Michael Bloomberg, another debonair gentleman. We're going to invite him to come up. I'm going to have my own raft, State Seal of New York, of course, because it's an official vehicle. I'm going to wear my uh, brawny uh, paper towel man shirt. Uh, and my raft will be the same as the other rafts, except the state police, for security reasons, want me to have an engine on my raft. <laughs> so that's going to happen this year, the Adirondack Challenge. I expect you all to be there and root me on to win the Adirondack Challenge. Another major potential to bring people to upstate New York is des destination resort casinos. Now, New York is technically not in the casino business. Our state constitution prohibits us from being in the casino business. We are in the racino business. What is a racino, you may ask? It's basically a casino with an R in the beginning of it. <laughs> because we couldn't legally pass casinos, the state passed a law allowing racinos, which are casino-like facilities, but technically not a casino because that would be illegal, with electronic games and they are currently all across the state. Now, unless you heard this presentation and unless you heard about racinos, you would think we are in the casino business because every place you go, they're called casinos and they are all across the state of New York, over 17 facilities, marketing, advertised, as casinos, but we don't regulate them as casinos, we don't get the revenues as casinos, uh, and the state is losing out, 17 all across the state. 39 casinos in the neighboring states around New York uh, that we're competing with. I want to propose a real casino gaming plan to boost upstate New York's economic development. We have in New York City 8 million residents, we have 50 million tourists visiting New York City. You want to grow the upstate economy, find a way to attract the people who are in New York City, the downstate area, the 50 million tourists, to come north. They're oriented east-west. They'll go to Pennsylvania, they'll go out to Long Island, they'll go to the Hamptons. We have to try to get them to come north. One of the great magnets could be, I believe, a cas casino resort destination day trips to come from New York City up. Right now, if you're at that New York City market, goes to Atlantic City, they go to Connecticut, they go to Pennsylvania, why shouldn't they go to upstate New York and let's have real casinos? I propose three in upstate New York as phase one. No casinos in New York City because part of it is we want people to come upstate. 90% of the revenue would be used for education. Uh, I would only cite them where the local government and the local community supports them. We'll have a national competition. We'll pick the best uh, with the best economic consequences for New York. It would require a referendum to be passed, and I propose putting it on the ballot in New York. But I would only do this if the legislature passes a non-political process. I don't want to get involved in casinos if it's going to be a politicized process through the New York State Legislature. But if we can do it right, and we can do it cleanly, and we can have a job generator in upstate New York, I say let's go into the casino business, we're there anyway, and let's create jobs in New York.
of our most important uh, functions as a government, as a society, is education. Governor William Seward talked about the importance of education for society. Two words for education, more and better. First, more learning time. This country is being left behind by other countries in terms of education and educational achievement. Part of the reason is we just don't educate our children as much as the other countries educate their children. We still have an education calendar that is based on the time when this country was an agrarian society, and we give children off in the summer so they can work in the fields. Other countries are just educating their children more time, more days in the classroom. So more learning time. Three options for more learning time. You can increase the school day rather than nine to three. Increase the school day. You can increase the year, more time in school, or you could do a combination of both. This is new. It is going to be uh, controversial. There are 700 school districts in the state of New York. What I'm saying to the 700 school districts is, look, it's up to you. You do education in your school district. I think we should educate our children more, but I'll leave it up to the local school districts. You want to extend the school day, you can extend the school day. You want to extend the school year, you can extend the school year. I encourage you to do whatever works for you, if, but I leave it up to the local option, but I want to incentivize it. And any local school district that increases the day or increases the year, the state government will pay 100% of the cost as an inducement for that local school district to expend, extend the day, extend the year. More early, more early education, pre-K works. Every study says the same thing. The earlier you start the education, the better it is for the student. We want to start full day pre-K. The results are breathtaking. We need pre-K for all children. We want to start in the uh, school districts that have the most economic need and providing additional funding for what they call full day pre-K at five hours per day. And we should start that today. More and better education in distressed communities. In poorer communities, a school actually has more obligations and responsibilities than a school in a, a richer community because the de demands of the school in a poorer community, frankly, are more severe. I want to create community schools, which are schools in distressed communities that need, where the population needs more support, and that school will be a hub for social service support. So it's not just a teacher, it's a teacher plus a nutritionist, plus a counselor, plus a mentor, plus after school programs, understanding that those children need more support in those areas. While education and economic opportunity are the engine, there is more to New York. New York is the equality capital of the nation. New York does things first and other states follow. And we have more to do in that regard. Two years ago, we passed marriage equality, which I believe is a civil rights act. passed marriage equality and other states learn from us. The old adage is true. When New York does it, everybody notices. And we change the nation's dialogue on marriage equality when the state of New York passed it. So I'm saying let's make history again and let's pass a Women's Equality Act because women still are subject to discrimination in this society. We have a 10-point Women's Equality Act agenda, shatter the glass ceiling. There is still a pay disparity between men and women. Women still make about 77 cents to a man's dollar, and it is unacceptable today. Zero tolerance for sexual harassment, strengthen employment lending anti-discrimination laws, strengthen human trafficking laws, which is a much worse problem than this society has, has, is prepared to admit and family status discrimination, that's against single women, prevent landlords from housing discrimination, 
stop pregnancy discrimination, protect victims of domestic violence, and protect a women's freedom of choice. <laughs> On the issue of gun violence, it's an issue that we've dealt with time and time again over the decades. Probably more severe and more stark, what happened in Newtown, Connecticut, what happened in Webster, New York, where a person called, set a car on fire during the Christmas season. First responders came to put out the fire that he had set, uh, and he was in his top floor window with a rifle and uh, killed the firefighters who responded to put out the fire. We passed in the state of New York the New York Safe Bill. It is a gun control measure that is reasonable, that is balanced, that is measured. It respects hunters and sportsmen and the Second Amendment, but it ends the unnecessary risk of high capacity assault <coughs> rifles. It keeps guns from the criminally and mentally ill. It bans assault weapons and high-capacity magazine. It closes the private sale loophole. Tougher penalties for illegal guns. And what's called the Webster provision for Webster, New York, mandatory life sentence for killing a first responder. In terms of government reform, there are local governments that are facing difficult economic choices. We're going to put together a joint task force with the Attorney General and the Controller, and we'll work with local governments if they need help in their restructure. All of this and one other thing. And the one other thing is responding to the crisis. You know, in your life, in government, head of a household, you can have plans, and you lay out your plans, and you follow your plans, but then you have to react to what happens today and react to the situations that are presented to you. And we have been presented two difficult situations, two crises to respond to. Storm, Hurricane Irene and Lee, seems like yesterday, August 28th, September 7th of 2011, and Hurricane Sandy, literally upstate, and downstate. Sandy was downstate, Irene and Lee were upstate. But when you put the two, the two of them together, they did tremendous damage uh, all across the state. First, let's learn from what happened. Some people will say, well, this is a 100-year flood. We now have 100-year floods every two years. I don't think they're 100-year floods anymore. And I think there's a fact that climate change is real, it is inarguable that the sea is warmer and that there is a changing weather pattern. This is not once in every 100 years. It will happen again, and we should learn and we should be ready because we can't go through this every time, and we can't come through it and say, well, that will never happen again. A little dose of reality, and the time to act is now. First, we have to make the government work smarter, faster, and better than it has ever before. We propose learning from the situation and mitigating the damage of the situation. If you have homes that are near rivers, oceans, beachfront, that have a tendency to flood, prepare, mitigate the construction of the home. Or if a person so chooses, buy out the home so we don't have the same damage year after year after year. There are places that Mother Nature owns she does. She may only visit every two years or three years or four years, but when she visits, that's where she's staying. And she's going to reclaim that land time and time and time again. So at one point you say, that's Mother Nature's, and you pack up and you move on. There are some homes that we've re rebuilt three times in six years. You know, at one point, it, it doesn't make sense to keep doing it again. We must harden our infrastructure. We have to have roads that are ready to prepare to deal with these types of storms. Our airports, the same thing. We can't be devastated every time there's a storm and business shuts down for two weeks. Our fuel delivery system, New York City, the whole downstate area, there was havoc in the fuel delivery system for two weeks. 
because the supply had been cut off for a day and a half. A one and a half day cut in supply because the freighters couldn't come in the harbor, it was two weeks of mayhem. We have to harden our utilities. It can't be every time the wind blows, a tree falls, and the power is out. We need to redesign our power system. We have to have a world-class emergency response network. We have to capitalize on our spirit of volunteerism and be organized to deal with volunteers. And we're going to set up a statewide volunteer corps before the fact that will do just that. Citizen education campaign. I want every person in this state to, do, to know what to do. If they hear an emergency broadcast, everyone is an emergency responder in their own home. And what does a parent do and what does the child do? If the parent's not home, everyone should be informed before the fact. Part of this reconstruction is going to be done by the state, in a so-called top-down format. But I also want to do it from the bottom up. And I want to say to the communities that were affected, you tell us how you should be rebuilt. And we'll provide the funding for that local community to come up with its own plan and its own vision for reconstruction. Our community reconstruction and mitigation plans are going to be just that. We're going to be saying to the affected communities, you tell us what you need, how you want to rebuild, and we will fund those communities. These are the, the communities under Hurricane Sandy that will be eligible for construction zones. These will be the areas under Irene and Lee that will have community reconstruction zones. Great news is we worked very hard, and hats off to our Congressional Congress, but the Congress, Congressional Delegation, but the Congress has awarded $30 billion to the state of New York to rebuild for Sandy, Irene, and Lee. $30 billion. So the $30 billion is good news, but the best news is that we are New Yorkers. And the best news is that we are united. And it is clear and it is true that this year we will have a lot of work to do. We had a lot of work to do to begin with, with our normal agenda. You put on top of that Sandy and Irene and Lee, and we really have our work cut out for us, and we really have a burden to deal with. But I'll tell you this in two years as being governor. And I'll tell you this, having been out there during Irene and Lee and Sandy. Yes, we have our issues, and we have our problems to deal with. But we also have a state like no other. And we have a citizenry like no other. And maybe it takes a bad situation to give us a shake and to wake us up. Maybe you have to be knocked down before you can get up. But I have seen this state come together in a way that warms my heart. And I have seen upstate New York show up in Staten Island and in Brooklyn to help victims of Hurricane Sandy. And I've been on street corners, and I've seen people getting out of the car who just got in their car in Buffalo and had seen on TV what happened on Sandy, and they just showed up on a street corner because this is New York, and they're New Yorkers, and they want to help. And these were their neighbors who needed help. I've seen the exact reverse. I've been in Essex, and I've been in St. Lawrence, and I've been in Schoharie, and I've seen people from downstate New York coming up to help after Irene and after Lee. And yeah, we have problems, but we have a source of strength and unity and a resilience as New Yorkers that makes it possible for us to do anything. And yes, it's going to be a rough year. And it's going to be a rough couple of years as we work our way out. But I truly believe that we are going to be better than we have ever been. I believe in this disaster, in these problems, we have an opportunity to build a state that we never built before. We're going to rebuild 2,000 miles of roads. We're going to rebuild our utility companies. We're going to be rebuilding our airports. We can build a state that is smarter, safer, and better than any state we've ever had before. And the key is that we're going to do it together. And that's what this moment is all about. Our coming together as citizens and people of one state 
committed to each other and committed to the state and committed to making this state a better state than we inherited. Because at the end of the day, it's very simple. You're here for a relatively short period of time, and it goes very, very fast. And the question is always the same. Did you leave this place a better place? And did you use your time on this earth to help one another and to make your contribution so that you leave a state, a home for your children better than you found it? And we're going to leave this state better than we found it. And we're going to do that together. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Governor. And I can very personally say that I know that you, Lieutenant Governor, your commissioners do listen. And so I encourage anyone in the audience to get involved and provide feedback to you. You can't do everything, but you certainly are, you, you listen, you want input, you take that and you do the best that you can. And, and I personally appreciate that. And, and the way you put the North Country at the top of your list, or at least appears that way, uh, we can't thank you enough for that. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you back uh, to Clarkson and to Potsdam. New York State has helped fund uh, the restoration of our iconic first building, Old Main. Uh, it will become the research and development headquarters for the Beacon Institute. More innovation, more technology that will commercialize. We look forward to welcoming you back uh, when we get to cut the ribbon, uh, and, and we just simply can't thank you enough. I do have something here, and that is that uh, if you want to find out more about the governor's agenda, you can go to www.newyorkgetinvolved.com. I encourage you to do that. With that, uh, thank you for all attending today, and let's give the governor one more round of applause. Thank you.